What's going on, people? Today, I'm very excited to share with you a live session that I did a couple months ago for my friend Tim and my sister Abby. From like a final product standpoint, this is one of my favorite videos that I've ever shot. I love how the images turned out and also the song is just awesome. I come back consistently and just watch this video just for fun. So I wanted to do something a little different today and just let you guys experience this song and just sit through the entire thing. We'll get to the lighting and the gear and all that afterwards, but I encourage you to grab some tea or some coffee, light yourself a vanilla pumpkin candle or any other variety and enjoy this song.
Go follow Tim and Abby on Spotify. I put both their links in my bio. Go follow them on Spotify and Instagram. They're both doing incredible stuff. Okay, now let's talk about how I shot it. Let's just get the gear out of the way first. So for this whole video, I used my Red Komodo and a Vazen 40 millimeter anamorphic lens. Some people have asked me about my experience with the Vazen and why I went with it for this video. Basically, long story short, uh, it's, it's cheap. And also because it is a 1.8 times squeeze factor. Specifically when I'm using my Komodo, the sensor on a Komodo is wide. Most cinema cameras will have a taller aspect ratio of their sensor that your camera can take advantage of when you are using anamorphic lenses. But since the Komodo sensor is already so wide, it's 17 by 9 aspect ratio, having something like a two times squeeze from say like an Atlas Orion, if I properly de-squeeze that image, it would come out to like this crazy wide aspect ratio, which is not what I was going for for this video. I wanted like a proper 2.4 to one aspect ratio for this. So that's why I went with the Vazen 90% because it's cheap and 10% because the 1.8 squeeze factor is nice because I don't have to punch in as much to get that 2.40 aspect ratio. And yeah, concluding thoughts about my experience with the Vazen, it was incredible to use. I think the image is just amazing out of them. It looks it looks very similar to the Orions. It has that blue flaring going on and I didn't like get any streaks or flares in this final video, but I did do some tests and it had that kind of that blue streaky flare that you see on the Atlas Orion. So it really reminded me of the character of that lens. Just way cheaper. And the build quality was awesome. It was like really hefty, really heavy, which is what I expected out of out of an anamorphic lens. I would say that my, the main downside that I experienced when using this lens is that I had to, I had to rent a plus one diopter to get uh, the close-ups in this video. So anytime you saw like close-up face, I was using a diopter and then I was not using a diopter for the wide. And that's pretty much the only shot that I wasn't using the diopter. You have to keep in mind, is this a close-up or am I gonna be farther away? Because if you're farther away and you're using the diopter, you won't be able to focus far enough. When you're not using the diopter, you won't be able to focus close enough. So it just doesn't have that range of focus that a normal lens would. Um, this is pretty typical of anamorphic lenses, but just to people who might be renting this lens, you might not be aware that you can't get like within three feet of your subject and focus on them unless you're using a diopter, which for those of you who don't know what a diopter is, it's basically like prescription glasses for your lens. So an anamorphic lens is, is far-sighted, so it gets a corrective piece of glass, which you can get certain different strengths. You can get like a half or a plus one or plus two. I don't know all the strengths, but I got a plus one for this particular video and it ended up being the perfect one for um, for my needs that day. But yeah, incredible lens. I was really blown away for how cheap this thing is to rent. It's a great option for anybody who is just trying out anamorphic for the first time. All right, now with camera and lenses out of the way, I wanna go over how I went about lighting this. So first of all, I just wanted to point out how important, how crucial set design and wardrobe is. We were going for like this 70s like living room nostalgic vibe and Tim and my friend Sam Greenhill, they brought in a bunch of old, really cool looking props and plants and lamps. And uh, we got that TV on Facebook Marketplace. And one of our friend Sam's friends, Grace, let us shoot in her living room. And she had this, she had this really cool like texture on her wall here. Yeah, location, wardrobe, set design. I can't even take credit for half of the stuff that's in this frame, but I just wanted to point out that that is very important for getting a certain look, is to make sure that actually what is in frame, those all have to align with the look that you're going for, if that makes sense. And then lighting will almost almost take care of itself, but it doesn't, so let's Let's dive in. Okay, so I'm gonna just stay parked on this wide shot for now because I lit it and then I didn't even touch it after that. So I can just show you everything based on this wide. All the other shots are just self-explanatory because I didn't change the lighting between shots. So here we go. To understand how I achieved this look, I think it's important to know what the room looked like before. I knew that I wanted to go for like a really dark and moody look. For me, when I'm going for something really moody, I don't want any light, any unnecessary light coming in from anywhere that I don't want it to come from. 
because all light will bounce around and fill your shadows and we don't want that. So first thing was, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I was shooting through a doorway like this. This is my camera. This is like a kitchen behind me and we had window here, window here. And so there was a lot of light filling this room and a lot of light therefore coming out like that. So I took two four by four floppies and just locked off these windows. And this is a great illustration, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. So no more light coming from this section. And so next you see now we have this window, this window, and then there was a window over here, which would have filled out all these shadows. It would have filled out here, here, here. So I took some duvetine and I gaff taped it over the window. And then finally, there was a living room over here, which had a bunch of more windows, but I just walked in a six by solid, and that's happening just outside of frame there on the left. The lesson here is you wanna focus on taking away the light that you don't want before you go about adding the light that you do want. So something I realized when I took all that light away was that the lamps were actually doing a lot of work. And I loved how they were not flattening out our subjects, but they're actually creating a lot of shape as well as a lot of color contrast, which is very important for uh, me because I love having good color contrast in my frame. And so these lamps, they're just, uh, they're like LED Edison bulbs. So they're very warm. They're like 2000 Kelvin, just LED bulbs. It's kind of creating some light, some shape here, some shape here. You can see what it's doing here, given this little edge, which is, which is all I needed. I didn't need like a full three quarters Rembrandt look. I'm trying to do this. Okay, just a little bit of shape, a little bit of that right there, and I'm good to go. I wasn't going for a whole lot of that wrap because I wanted to keep it more moody, play it more more down into the darker, more edgy range. So yeah, it was all shadow, pretty much, and I was very happy about that. And this little edge here is doing a lot for us, so yes. Now for the most interesting part of the lighting setup, I think, is our key light for Tim. You can see, if you look closely, you'd be like, wait a second, there's something coming from up here because there's some highlight here on his knees and his head, his hands, and more obviously, there in the close-ups, you can see his whole face is being lit by something and it's coming from directly above him. So what could it be? Your guess is as good as mine. Just kidding. Okay, so what that was was actually a Light Mat 8 boomed above him on a Mini Max stand. So Light Mat 8, I'll show a picture of it, but it's basically like a big 4x4 LED that is pretty pretty lightweight, so you're able to, to boom it out over people on something like a Mini Max stand. And I use it all the time for like top-down soft lighting just because it's really convenient for that and it's also bicolor. So, something else I wanted to talk about is white balance. I actually set my white balance before even turning this light mat on. I looked at this scene, I saw the windows, I saw the lamps, I saw the TV, and then I just kind of scrolled on my white balance until I found a point where I felt like there was the most color contrast that I could get. Because I didn't want everything looking warm, I didn't want everything looking blue. I wanted it to be like the most color contrast that I could get out of it. So I kept scrolling. I forget where I landed. I think I landed at like 3,800 Kelvin or 4,000 Kelvin or something like that. The beauty of having the light mat is that it is bicolor. So once I set my white balance for the most color contrast between the lamps and the curtains and the TV and all that, then I was able to set my light mat exactly where I was balanced on the camera so that it renders his skin tones perfectly neutral. That's just the look I was going for. Maybe it would have been better if I would have like set it super warm like the lamps, almost like simulating a overhead light fixture or something like that, but I just wanted to keep it neutral for, for whatever reason. I don't know. And that's like literally it for the lighting. Um, literally, that's it. Something else that's really important is what I set my exposure for. So at first I was gonna crank the light mat and then expose for the windows to be darker. But since I loved what the lamps were doing, I kept my aperture wide open and I didn't use any ND. So the camera's actually letting in a ton of light. I just played everything down in frame. The lamps were coming in more hot, but then I turned them down with dimmers. And then the TV actually had brightness control on it, which was like super clutch. And the light mat, I dimmed it as much as I could with like still seeing his face. I think it ended up being like 
12% or something like that, 12% brightness. I don't remember, but everything was actually pretty dark. And even though these windows went a little brighter than I was originally anticipating, I actually liked the blue flaring that I was getting here. I was just like, great, um, bring on bring on the brightness in the background. I think this is the only shot that was like clipping just barely, but um, softened it out with some glow. It's all good. Also, that's not Duvetine. It's not. I guess this would be a good time to uh, talk about the skirt that I put on the light mat. Basically, I just cut these pieces of duvetine, which are just like black fabric for those of you who are unfamiliar. And what that did was it kept it so that it was just all the light was falling here and nowhere outside of there. So it's not going to hit Abby and flatten out her shadows. It's not going to hit Nate. So that's how I kept the maximum mood. If I didn't have a skirt, it probably would have like filled out this shadow too and just kind of flattened out the room a little more than I wanted to. That's why having that skirt is really important for keeping your soft light from going everywhere. Is that it? So yeah, that's like, that's basically it. It was a really simple lighting setup, but also very effective. So yeah, I think the biggest lessons here for like creating a moody look is see where you can take away light, especially for interiors, because you'll find like there are a bunch of windows that are letting in light where you don't necessarily want light to come in from. So block out those windows, add negative fill, and then the light that you do add will be much more effective. You won't have to battle, you won't have to fight so many sources going on. So anyways, that's it for this video. Oh, and the color grade. If you wanna know about the color grade, I can tell you in like 10 seconds, I built a custom LUT that I had in my monitor, and so it basically looked like this while I was shooting. I can tell you the whole no treat. Let's just make let's just make the no treat. We're actually on resolve right now. Okay, I got one of the raw clips. So this is this is the the LUT that I had in my camera. Is just this is how I made the LUT. I was gonna do a whole video on this, but it's really simple. I might still do a video on it, but you guys, you you guys getting special treatment today. <laughs> Here's what I did to make that light. I did a color space transform node. Let me just label all my nodes for you. So color space transform. I picked my camera settings, but you can just choose whatever camera you're working on. This is all I did. Just, yeah, red log 3G10, cine on film log for output gamma, and then the LUT, put this LUT on, which is the Kodak 2383D60 for Rec. 709 which is a free LUT built into DaVinci Resolve. On my saturation node, I just went into here, the RGB mixer, and I just turned up all of the R's and the G's and the B's. Not all of them, just those. And then this whole node overall, I just turned down the gain until like, it's probably like something like that. So it's not super saturated. So this right here, what you're seeing is what I was seeing in camera when I was shooting. Oh, by the way, if you don't know how to make a LUT, once you have that grade done, just literally right click on your clip, generate LUT, 33 point cube. That's what my camera takes um, is the 33 point cube. So you can load it into your camera or into your monitor, depending on if you have a camera or monitor that's compatible with loading LUTs. And then for the actual grade, I mean, I just did some simple stuff let it breathe a little bit. Um, I did like a glow or something. So I did something like this, spread it out. It was very rough, it was very basic. Yeah, I don't know, man, something like that. Basically done -zo. I did something with the highlights. I think I might've done that. Okay, I think I cooled it off too. Maybe. I think I colorized the glow a little bit as well. A little bit of like teal action. That's like pretty close to what the final look was. I added some, some film grain as well. Of course, you got to. Yeah, that's, that's really close. So yeah, that's basically it for this video. Hope you guys learned, learned something. Hope you were entertained. I hope you enjoyed the live session. Again, go follow their links in the description. Abby and Tim also put Nate's down there. He uh, he called off work to be in this shoot. So shout out to Nate, go Venmo him or something. If you have any questions related to this video or not, shoot them in the comments and I will get back to you ASAP. I put a Vimeo link in the description for this video as well if you want to watch it in higher quality. You can also check out other videos that I've done because I don't post all my work here on YouTube. So if you see something and you're like, wow, I want you to tell me how you did that or <laughs> how did you do that so that I know to not do it that way because it sucks, I'd be happy to let you know how you shouldn't do it. My candle's running low, so 
type in the comments which candle I should get next. So I'll catch you guys on the next one.